Well, uh, this is Easter, a wonderful day, and uh, of course it comes at a at a good time where we need the hope that comes from Easter. We've all experienced loss, uh, maybe some savings for me, business, uh, freedom, uh, but there have been gains. Uh, for me, I've gained five pounds. How about you? <laughs> By the way, with the quarantine, I'm at that point of desperation where I'm baking bread. And I found some cornbread mix in the cupboard. So I thought, oh, that would be good. So I mixed it up and I put it in the oven. And you know that aroma where uh, when you're baking, just permeates the whole house? I didn't have any of that. And I got the cornbread out, cornbread muffins. And uh, they did look a little grayish, more than they're supposed to. And I tasted it, and they tasted like cardboard. And it was at that point that I thought, and you've probably thought this before me, check the expiration date. It was 2014. So that's what's in the back of my cupboard. Well, we need humor to get us through this, I think. And uh, so here's one. How does the Easter Bunny keep his fur looking so good? Hairspray. Uh, you're muted. I need a laugh track here. <laughs> you, you might not tell, uh, you should not tell bad jokes to the, an Easter egg. Why? They might crack up. Uh, how does the Easter Bunny stay in shape? He exercises. Egg puns are the worst, aren't they? Somebody's saying, exactly. Uh, speaking of eggs, Jimmy Kimmel said, Easter doesn't feel at all exciting this year, probably because I've spent the last three weeks driving around looking for eggs already. Um, but the hens are laying here in Petaluma, so we've got eggs if, if you need some. Uh, this year, uh, all the Easter jokes have to be inside jokes. The mayor ordered that, I think. And here's one from uh, Neil Diamond, and I love it. It goes like this. Hands, washing hands, reaching out. I won't touch you. Don't touch me. Sweet Caroline. Well, the coronavirus pandemic has sent waves of anxiety uh, crashing through our lives. We worry about our loved ones and we worry about food. We worry about money, retirement savings. Now, you might worry about that tightness in your chest, uh, wondering, if, is it stress or is it something more serious? Uh, psychologists are warning us that after the health pandemic close on its heels may come an emotional pandemic. Uh, there are common psychological uh, factors that we're experiencing uh, from the from the stress, anxiety, uh, confusion, insomnia, anger, post-traumatic stress uh, symptoms. Uh, William Martinez, who's the assistant professor of psychiatry at UCSF, said, "Anxiety for many folks is really about uh, loss of control, and I, anxiety comes from the lack of it." There's a larger kind of existential question about how much power do we really have if this small thing that we can barely see is causing our entire world's economy to come to its knees and shutting down entire nations, he said. All these are definitely highly stressful factors for anyone who had a past history or if they're already experiencing depression or anxiety or things like that. And part of what is stressful is just the lack of good information. Uh, so one man, Matt Pucci, said, I'm not as afraid as most people. He said, I'm a scientist. I believe in data. But he says, what concerns me is the lack of data. There is very little information that is not politicized available in the United States. The not knowing has been stressful. And so somebody I follow on Twitter said, people crave certainty. And that's why conspiracy theories flourish. It's easier to believe that this is because of 5G towers, nefarious government agents, or a liberal media hoax than to admit the reality that no one really knows what's going to happen and nobody is 100% in control. 
And so sometimes we'd rather believe that evil humans are in control of things than face the reality that sometimes we're at the mercy of nature and we have to make it up as we go along. Well, the usual solution is go to therapy and <laughs> we can't go anywhere. Uh, so what helps? Well, we talked about this a few weeks ago. The most important essential that helps is faith. It's trusting God. It's holding out hope that God has a good future in store for us. And that's why we need the hope of resurrection like never before. And of course, that's our focus today. In Matthew 28, verse 1, our first scripture, it says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And so this resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's what gives us hope. But it comes in a historical context. It comes, it's the culmination of what we call Holy Week or the Passion Week, which uh, started on Sunday with Palm Sunday. Jesus riding into Jerusalem, a hero. And then he spends a few days in the temple or around the temple preaching and teaching. And then there's the Last Supper, which we think is probably Thursday night with the disciples and he washes their feet and he tries to warn them of what's to come. And then they go out to the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane where he prays, Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. And then there are the cruel trials with Herod and Pilate, the bartering with Barabbas, and, and then the gruesome crucifixion and the death of Jesus, the burial. And then comes Sabbath, Saturday, the, that long Saturday of waiting. And then the Sunday that we now call Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, we love to celebrate Easter and we're eager to get to Easter. We, we like Mardi Gras and then we like Easter, but the 40 days of Lent in between we're not so fond uh, of. But in our lives uh, today, we don't have that privilege. We're living uh, Lent right now. Somebody said, uh, I never intended to give up so much for Lent. You know, maybe you, you were willing to give up chocolate, but you never intended to shut down the whole Seas Candy enterprise. And that's what has happened. But I, I relate in that Holy Week uh, sequence, I relate most to that Thursday after the Last Supper when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke says in his gospel, it was Jesus' custom uh, to bring the disciples there. It was one of their favorite places, apparently, when they were in Jerusalem. In Matthew 26, verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went and his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus is alone in prayer and he's attempting to wake his disciples, inviting them to come and pray with him and they try but they fall asleep and so Jesus is alone he's isolated can you relate in his suffering he's not yet suffering actually it, but it's a very real anticipation of suffering and sometimes that's almost as as if you are suffering 
It's the dread of what's to come. And I feel like that's where we are. We're isolated. Some of us are alone. We're living with dread, not knowing what the future holds, who will get sick, uh, who will die. Some are sick already. Some are in pain. And many of us have lost money and income. For many of us, just the anticipation, the dread of the unknown, that's the suffering. And so we pray, Lord, take this away. Let us get through this right away. Or in Jesus' words, uh, let this cup pass. And Jesus prayed that, and after he prayed for the cup to pass, he continues and he says, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus could surrender his future to God the Father because he knew what was coming after the suffering. Uh, he was confident in the resurrection, that things would be better than they were before. And we may be living in our time of Gethsemane, but we too can Surrender to our loving God, trusting God with our future. Not my will, but your will be done. And we have hope that because Jesus was raised from death to life, we too will be raised to abundant and eternal life with Christ. This resurrection narrative is embedded in our literature, in our movies, the comeback story, the story of the underdog. Resurrection is our constant hope. Uh, I like the story. I, I was in line at Home Depot a long time ago, and I picked up this book that was there at the checkout counter, and I opened it up. Uh, the book was uh, orange, I remember, and the first words on the page were, you're fired. It was the story of Arthur Blank, who uh, at the time worked for Handy Dan Home Improvement Centers. He was the president of finance, and his friend Bernard Marcus was the CEO of Handy Dan, and they were both fired as a result of an internal power struggle. So they were fired, yes, devastated, not for long. Uh, instead, they decided to get together and start uh, a new store. They had a vision of one-stop shopping for the do-it-yourselfer. And, of course, the store revolutionized the home improvement business with its warehouse concept. And Blank and Marcus uh, made billions as a result with Home Depot. We love resurrection type stories. Uh, you know, the story of Kurt Warner, the quarterback who uh, following his uh, college career at Northern Iowa uh, or University of Northern Iowa, Warner went undrafted in the 1994 NFL draft. Well, he was invited and uh, he took advantage of an opportunity to try out for the Green Bay Packers, but he didn't make it. After he was released, Warner was stocking shelves at a Hy-Vee grocery store in Cedar Falls, Iowa for $5.50 an hour. And so with no NFL teams willing to give him a chance, he turned to the Arena Football League and did well there. And so finally he made it in the NFL, but they sent him to Europe and he played in the Europe League for a while. Then he had a tryout with the Chicago Bears. But he had an injury to his throwing elbow, which was caused by a spider bite during his honeymoon. Nothing was going right for this poor guy. Well, finally, he got a chance in the NFL, and uh, uh, he was the number two quarterback on the Rams, St. Louis. I think they were St. Louis at, at the time. And uh, uh, Trent Green, the starting quarterback, broke his ACL, and so uh, reluctantly they handed the reins over to Kurt Warner. And as I recall, he threw um, 14 uh, touchdown passes in his first four games. He had an MVP season, and in uh, the Super Bowl of 2000 was the MVP of the Super Bowl. They won the Super Bowl. He had a stellar career. He's now in the Hall of Fame. But he went from store clerk to NFL MVP. It's a sort of a resurrection story. The resurrection narrative is the blooming of the lily that comes from this dead-looking bulb. You wouldn't imagine anything could come from it, but a beautiful flower. It's the death of one beanstalk that leaves only seeds, which when planted sprout forth rows of beans. It's the withering and the death of a sunflower that becomes a bird feeder. It's the birth of a baby after a long pregnancy and the labor Resurrection narrative is the hope of every person who embraces uh, recovery from addiction. Not that they 
uh, that we want to be restored to how we were before, but that we uh, can be, in a sense, resurrected to the person that we were created to be, intended to be all along, not going back, but going forward. And that's what resurrection is. The ultimate resurrection story, of course, is from death to life, that of Jesus. Uh, from death to, to uh, life everlasting and abundant. And that's our best hope, is, is resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, verse 42, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. That sounds like restoration. But it's raised imperishable, resurrection. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. COVID-19 entered our world, they think, November of 2019, and will never be the same. We may be worse off, we may be better off, but we can't go back to the way things used to be. But resurrection gives us hope that COVID-19 is the seed that brings tribes and parties and nations together in a unity that's based on what we have in common, our common fears, our common fragility our common destiny. COVID-19 has brought a pause to wars in Syria and Iran and Afghanistan and Yemen. We don't want to go back to wars in those places. We can hope for a better uh, future and make it happen. Crime is down in San Francisco. We don't want to go back to crime and homeless people on the streets. And um, Resurrection gives us hope that estranged family members will join us again to grieve together and hold each other close and hope for a family, the likes of which we've never experienced. Resurrection gives us hope that our city, our nation, uh, can some, uh, somehow together in unity solve our deepest problems and bow humbly before God in repentance and trust. As Paul writes, when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so with the COVID-19 threat, the worst case scenario for us individually is death. But we can say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So what's going to help us get through this crisis? Well, certainly we need to get reliable, solid information and then leave it at that. It's not good to watch news all day. Uh, but get information, physical distancing, certainly. We call it social distancing. But what we're doing, we're socially connecting. And that's important. We should keep doing that while at the same time uh, physical distancing. Uh, I've, I've uh, watched some TV shows with my daughter uh, using Zoom. It works fairly well. Uh, in person would be better. But she's five, 600 miles away anyway. Uh, you can use FaceTime to share a meal together. Uh, sadly, what's happening during times of stress, we tend to sometimes push people away. Um, I pray the opposite will happen. Get active with service if it's safe for you to do that. Uh, make donations to a food pantry. Donate blood if you can. Make masks. Certainly pray for each other. Uh, for me, it helps to get out and exercise, take long walks, and I've had some good bike rides this week. But the most important thing that will help us get through this or any crisis in life is faith. Trusting God that God cares for us. God knows what's going on. And praying, connecting, meditating with God. And one of the prayers I go back to again and again is in Psalm 46. And I want to close by reading this psalm. Try to imagine in your mind what's being talked about here. 
We think we're going through crisis. Imagine this. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease. To the ends of the earth he breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Can you imagine all that going around around us. And so how do we respond to all these disasters around us? And we could add a few more disasters, the things we can't see, virus, uh, fear, panic, loss of money, loss of jobs, uh, some the loss of loved ones. Do we run, hide, hoard, hunker down? Let me continue with what the psalm says. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will ex be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That harks back to the opening of the psalm. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. That's our hope. And so let's take time to turn to God and pray. Lord, thank you for the confidence we have that death is not the end. It's just the beginning. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So we have nothing to fear, nothing to dread. And so give us that confidence to know that you're watching out for us. We pray for those who are sick, that you'll bring healing to them. Uh, Lord, forgive us for those times when we fail to trust you take matters into our own hands. We try to control. We push people away. Lord, forgive us. Uh, Lord, we ask that you will spare us from this deadly virus. Bless your people with health and vigor and the peace of Christ. We lift up our mayor, our city council, uh, county supervisors, governor, president, Congress. Give our nation unity of purpose understanding, wisdom, compassion. We pray for those on the front lines, doctors and nurses, hospital workers, those who clean the place up, and people who respond to 911 calls, people providing food and groceries. Lord, keep them safe, protect them, give them uh, strength. We lift up our neighbors. And Lord, give us our daily bread what we need for each day and we will trust you lord we need you we need you like never before in jesus name we pray amen <laughs>